It's a holiday weekend. We have a little lighter attitude in our hearts sometimes when there's a holiday and we get to enjoy some things we don't do on a routine basis. And maybe you've brought that kind of attitude here with you as you've worshipped. Just that it's a good weekend. But you know God has good things here for you as well to add to your weekend and to make it a better weekend. I want to read a, a verse from Psalm 127.1, and we're going to look at it in a little different way, but it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain, and unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Let's pray. God, you are the builder. You are the one who watches. You have construction projects underway within each of our lives. You love us. You pour out your presence among us. You're with us even today and this weekend and the things that we have planned and maybe unplanned that will take place. You're a God who is over all and through all and in all. And as you're watching over us today, we receive that care. And we give you thanks for it. And we thank you that you're actively working in us to construct your building, your house. So open our thoughts and our minds and our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want to be closer to the Lord? This will help you as you take in its basic thoughts today. We've been thinking for some weeks in this series of sermons on balancing the Christian life because there's some things talked about in Scripture and we look at another place of Scripture and we think, well, how do those two things fit together? And how does it balance? And there are some theologies that will emphasize just one area really heavy and leave out something else, and another group of theologians will emphasize something else, and you just wonder, how do we put it together? That's what we're trying to do in this series of sermons. And we're looking this morning at being dependent and yet being disciplined at the same time. So think of yourself seated on an airplane 35,000 feet in the air, And this would never happen, but just pretend with me this morning that this would happen, okay? Suppose this pilot would come over the loudspeakers and say, folks, we're in trouble. One of the wings is going to fall off. Which would you like, the right or the left? It's a silly question because it, it wouldn't be a choice. But you can't fly a plane with one wing, I'm told that multi-engined airplanes, you can fly for a period of time in kind of an emergency mode, and you can be okay until you can find a place to land. But you can't fly with just one wing. I want you to visualize it looking down from above, like the illustration on your outline that's in your bulletin. You don't have to use it, but you can look at it for a moment if you choose not to. But on the, the two wings are one word each. One is dependent, one is discipline. And it illustrates an important part of the Christian life um, that we're going to look at today. Just like an airplane, you have to have both wings in order to fly. As a Christian, I have to be dependent and I have to be disciplined in order to operate well and to function. We've been talking in this series of sermons, as well as balancing the Christian life, the aspect about holiness. God calls us to be holy. He says, I am holy, you are to be holy. So our job is to pursue holiness, going after it, and we're going after it in these different ways of how to balance. This morning, as we pursue holiness, we have to think about dependency and being disciplined. So from this standpoint, I'm using the word discipline to mean the activities that are designed to train us in a particular skill. 
to train us in godliness. That's the skill we're after. Holiness is what we're after. So God is using some discipline in our lives in order to go after this thing. First uh, Timothy 4.7, Paul tells Timothy, train yourself or discipline yourself to be godly. And he borrows a word from athletics where athletes train to be competitive in a game. They are to do certain activities that will help them get to the goal and help them win. And in time, that word was used in other areas like mental training and moral training. And Paul uses it here in Greek writing as spiritual training. And did you notice that um, Paul told Timothy to train yourself? We have a part in that big process of holiness. So that as I pursue being holy, I must not carry out my responsibilities in my own strength, but we're to be dependent on the Holy Spirit to enable me to do that. We have a responsibility. God has a responsibility. It's a balancing act of sorts. And don't assume that it's all up to God. He does not do what we can. That's another way of saying, I have a responsibility, God has a responsibility. So as we look at this subject, do I work more or do I pray more? That's a question that sometimes we wrestle with. What am I to do in this situation? Am I to go, go after it with physical labor or effort? Or do I just sit and pray? We think often in terms of one or the other, but here in Psalm 127 that we began the sermon with, unless the Lord builds the house, it's builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Now the psalmist sees God as intimately involved in this construction process and in the watching and he says, unless the Lord builds it. He does not say, unless the Lord helps the builders here. But unless the Lord builds and watches. Now the writer sees God is building. And he sees those construction workers. And he sees the guards watching over the city. And the builders can't put away their tools and decide, hey, I'm going fishing today. They're in the construction process. And the watchman can't say, ah, oh, tonight I'm too tired. I'm going to go home and go to bed. I'll just let the Lord watch over the city. Neither is going to work very well. The builders have to work to carry out the responsibilities, but also, also have total dependence upon God. He builds, he watches. <laughs> Nehemiah understood well this principle in the Old Testament of being dependent on the one hand and of discipline on the other. And his project was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem that had crumbled and fallen down and um, he faced a lot of opposition from the enemies around Israel in building this wall. And when the walls got about halfway up, it says that all these enemies got together and they decided they were going to come and uh, fight and argue and maybe attack Israel in this way to keep them from building the walls all the way up and to have protection. And Nehemiah 4 says, 4 9, but we prepared or we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So that Nehemiah's response was, I pray and I watch. I do both. I am dependent and yet I am disciplined. I ask God for help, but I put in some effort to this. Um, people often, in whatever needs that they have, will find themselves in kind of two camps. Do I pray? Do I work? You know, the spiritual people will set up an all-night prayer meeting, and they'll go and pray. The practical people will set up a list. Who's going to take this hour? Who's going to take this hour? Who's going to take this hour? Who's going to do that? 
we might need some other kinds of things, and they'll organize it in all their ways. And our, in our humanness, we would probably argue, depending on our own bent and um, leanings, that one is maybe better than the other. Those organizing are too busy to pray, and those praying, they're praying. They're, they're not going to work. Well, Nehemiah and the people did both in this situation. They prayed and they posted a guard and they recognized we have a dependence upon God, but also understanding in order to defend ourselves, we have to de depend on God to enable us to put some effort into this. Now, there are rare exceptions. You know what rare is. Doesn't happen very often. It's the exception, not the rule, where God intervenes with a miracle. In 2 Chronicles 20, just for your information, we're not going to go into it, but it's just an example of that if you want to look that up, of how God just intervened in a miracle. But there is no single instance in the New Testament when uh, God is teaching about holiness that he disconnects dependency and discipline. His part and our part, it's always connected. And the training of ourselves, this discipline is not necessarily relying on human effort and flesh, although it can be. We never get the impression from Paul that he's teaching Timothy, just put all your, your effort, physical will and uh, um, power into it, or human effort. But he urges Timothy in 2 Timothy to be strong in the grace and power of the Lord, to strengthen himself. That's his job as a human. He doesn't say, oh, just turn it all over to the God. We need both wings in the airplane if we're going to fly. I want us to look at Paul's example or testimony, and I want to look at Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13. It says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So he needed to work on being content. Contentment is not natural for us. There are all kinds of things daily coming into our lives that say, I want that. I want this. I'm unhappy with my circumstances, my state of being, whatever it is. And he had to learn it. He needed to grow in that area of life. He didn't just turn it over to the Lord, as the saying goes, and trust him to do all the work and just kind of sit back and say, okay, God, bring it on. But he worked at it. And he knew that he could be content only with the Lord's help, who gave, gives him strength. It was, strength was not just a package sent by UPS from heaven. But it was his as he's connected to Christ. And by faith he could rely on the Spirit's power. So he combined the two, dependence and discipline, in the, his ministry efforts. I'd like to look at Colossians 1, 28 and 29. It says, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. He says he's working to the point in ministry of struggling, to the point of weariness and exhaustion. Some of us know what that's like. But if you know much of his life or want to read about it in the book of Acts, you know that he was very intense about his work. He worked hard, physically, mentally, spiritually. He faced many kinds of problems and persecutions. And as we read a list of descriptions, we go, man, this man has really experienced life. And he says that he does it with his effort, which so powerfully works in me. Paul was disciplined to work. 
and yet dependent upon the Lord for help. He didn't try to fly the airplane with one wing. Now these two different approaches, there's really two different approaches to this subject. Yes, we've got two different wings, but as we look at the subject, there are different approaches, and one is the passive approach. Let the Lord live his life through me. It's a scriptural approach from the Holy Spirit to enable us to live lives that are pleasing to God. He does not do the work for us, but he enables us. And so often we might hear the expression, let the Lord live his life through me, but it's not a great approach because it has, it implies I can sit back and do nothing and just say, God, come on. You're so great, you're so powerful, you can do anything. Here's the thing I'm waiting for you to do. But the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit enables us to live a life that's pleasing to him. And instead, God enables me to live this life through him. Let's just say we're having trouble loving a fellow Christian. I know that never happens. We love everybody equally and well. But let's just pretend again. And we struggle with it, and God says, Kevin, you need to love this guy. I love him. You need to get up to speed and love him too. And we need to pray in that moment for God to help me to love this guy. It's not natural maybe for me to, or I don't want to, and I know that I should, so God, enable me. Over time, our attitude can change, and we can actually love a person. I've seen that in my life. You've probably seen it in yours. There was a guy, I hadn't thought about this illustration, when I was in college that was just kind of, he was a nerd, and everybody knew he was, but he was just a chatterbox, and very lonely, an only child whose father had died, and his mother came to college campus and changed the tire on his car when he needed it. Gives you a little picture and he would wander around the dorm wanting friends and he would keep coming to my room and coming to my room and coming to my room and I kept thinking oh man but God enabled me to love him so that I really did love him over time we're not passive here in this pursuit of holiness We must do the loving. Colossians 3.12 says, Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness, patience. And this is more than semantics, more than playing with words. It's an understanding, how does God work in us? And the essence of this passive view, some people might call it, well, it's really a faith approach. And there, there is that element. And some view it that way, But it's man's part to trust, and it's God's part to work. And the believer does nothing and leaves it all to God. And the idea that we can do nothing is troubling. The psalmist doesn't take that view. Nehemiah doesn't take that view. Paul doesn't take that view. Man's part is to trust and to work. God's part is to enable me. God's work does not make our effort unnecessary or ineffective. Paul didn't say, Christ showed contentment through me. He says, I learned contentment through him. John Owen, I I quoted a couple weeks ago in a sermon, and he has some things to say about this subject this morning. Let us consider what regard we ought to have to our own duty in the work of God. Some would separate these things as inconsistent. If holiness is our work, then some would say that there's no room for grace. And if it's all grace, then there's no room for work. But our work and God's grace are nowhere opposed in the pursuit of holiness. We cannot perform our work without God's help, 
nor does he give us his grace for any other purpose than to work. We're responsible to go after holiness, to seek godliness. We're not just to turn it over to the Lord and let the Lord live through us. No, it calls us to love each other. That's an action. I have to do something. It says to put to death the sins of the body. That means I have to do something in that regard. We are to put off the old man and put on the new man. That means doing something about it. It's work. And if we're ever going to be godly, we have to assume our responsibility in these things. So that along with our dependence comes the Holy Spirit's help. Sometimes we feel like we're not getting any strength from God. And there are times when we experience failure. We may even cry over the sins because we've been tempted and we give in to them. And where's God helping me? We understand what Paul writes in Romans 7. I do not, under, or do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Why doesn't the Holy Spirit strengthen me? Well, there could be some other things going on. God could be saying, you need to see, really, what a sinful heart you have. And when you fail again and again and again, you will see that clearer. He may want you to get this. You're really weak. You think you're full of strength, but you're weak. He may address pride issues or say that you need to be humble more in this way. Whatever the case, it depends on him. God will respond in the ways that are best for you. But the other approach, as opposed to the passive approach, is the self-discipline. I can do it all. I'm good. I'm organized. I have the strength. I have the knowledge, your background, whatever it is. Either approach, if you carry it to extremes, it's just going too far because you're flying on one wing rather than the other. It's true that disciplined people can change, bring change for themselves. I've been told that within bookstores, the largest section of any bookstore are self-help books. And they are full of plans and hope and encouragement and ideas, and if you buy in, that helps you. If you think of the self-help uh, as far as a Christian goes, we think about, well, I'll read the Bible, I pray, I might learn a little bit about fasting, I might do some other activities that are involved in a spiritual nature because that's all part of you know, the idea. Following spiritual disciplines, though, does not replace the Holy Spirit. We need to stop and think about that for a minute. All of these activities that I've just talked about are clearly encouraged in Scripture. We are to read God's Word. We are to pray. We are to fast. We are to involve ourselves in some different things to help ourselves. But it does not replace our dependence on the Holy Spirit and to ask for it. There are things... Um, well, 1 Corinthians 3, 7 tells us we can plant and we can water. But we cannot make things grow. Only the Holy Spirit does that. There are things we must do, we must plant, we must water. But then the process is left up to God. Do you see these correlations? We can depend on the planting and watering, though, more than on the Lord. We do our part and yet we ask for his help. If we follow this illustration of farming for a few minutes, there are certain things a farmer must do and certain things he cannot do. These are the things he can do. He can plow and plant and fertilize and cultivate and water, um, harvest. But the things he cannot do is make it grow and control the weather. And in this illustration, there are six things that the farmer can do, two things the farmer can't do. 
Sometimes farmers trust their ability. I've been a farmer for X number of years. I understand machinery, the field, the plants, the fertilizer, all those kind of things. I got it down. I'm going to have a great crop. But he can't control the weather. He can't make things grow. He puts the confidence in his own ability. And just like farming, God has given certain disciplines that are necessary to help us. But we have to do them. God's provided us with prayer, but we have to pray. He's given us his word, but we have to read it or listen to it. If we don't do our part, we're not going to grow. We will not produce the crop that God wants if we're not willing to do the work. But there's something we cannot do. I cannot make myself grow spiritually. I can engage in the activities, but I need to ask God, use them. Help me. Connect things to my life with these disciplines. And just like the farmers will put their confidence typically in their work, sometimes as Christians we think, if I go to church, that's good. That's enough. Or if I read the Bible, I put my confidence in that, and I don't really ask for God's help. John Owen, that I quoted earlier, continues, and he says, The actual old and internal operation of the Spirit of God is necessary to produce every holy act from our work and effort. And though salvation is implanted in the believer, we still stand in need of divine enablement of the Holy Spirit in every single act toward God. So even though we have a new heart, we have a new life that God's given to us, I have to nourish that heart, I have to water that heart, I have to feed that heart. It does not operate apart from God. Jonathan Edwards was a pastor in the 1700s in early colonial America. He decided, I'm going to make a list of things that will help me grow spiritually, and he came up with 70 activities that would help him grow as a Christian. Talk about determined. I don't think I could come up with 70, much less think that I could do them. But our list would kind of appear like a kindergarten list. But he wrote this about his list of 70 resolutions. Being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions and trust them to be agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. He was disciplined. And he was dependent. Now, if our personality leans toward self-discipline, that I'm organized, I can do all this in my own strength, we really have to agree that I need some dependence on the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we believe that we are dependent on the Holy Spirit, but do we really practice that? I mean, every day, do we depend on him? Or is it that we, we hope he helps us in my self-help effort? Now, I'm going to put in the work, but I'm just assuming he's going to do something good. And don't really ask for his help. John, in John 15, 5, says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Those are words that cause us to pause. I can put all kinds of effort into stuff that's good stuff and good effort. But he says, apart from me, you won't accomplish anything. Anything of value, anything of good, you need to ask for my help. And there, in, in our lives, we can look at some morals or ethics and say, you know, I, I'm really good at this. I, I never tell a lie. I'm always generous. I can blah, blah, blah. I. I'm good at this. Those are just characteristics of who I am. 
morals and ethics, and we can feel confident. We rely on our goodness. And we kind of think, what do I need the Holy Spirit for? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need a conscious dependence on Christ. And the way that we get that is through prayer. It's that tangible expression of dependence. We may like to believe that we're dependent on Christ, but if your prayer prayer life is meager, you're not dependent on him. Sometimes we just kind of throw out some prayers here and there, and we think, we're doing really good. You're not dependent on him. You're just throwing out some prayers. We're saying, I can handle this on my own, that I've got my Christian stuff together. And we pat ourselves on the back. But there's no thought of really pursuing, going after, being holy. Because we're content as we see other people content as well, many times. Psalm 119 is a huge, long chapter. You know that. 176 verses. And every verse but four It talks about the importance of God's word as he writes. I want to read a few of those verses, verses 33 to 37. It says, Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I'll keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. So he takes a little aspect of living life and he connects it to God's word. Goes back and forth, back and forth, because there's a connection. He wants to be taught by God. He wants God to give him understanding, to direct his life. He stored up God's word in his heart. He's talked about it. He's rejoiced in it, meditated on it, delighted in it. He didn't negate it. He has this sense of there's discipline on my part. There's dependence upon God. So let's look at prayer as we finish this morning. Really, there are two forms, planned prayer and unplanned. Then the story of Nehemiah that I referred to at the beginning of the sermon, we find this is true as well. He's led the Israelites to rebuilding a broken wall. And he's fasted and prayed over a period of several months, how do I go about this, God? And how do you want it done? And there, there has to be, as he demonstrates, regular times Maybe daily, maybe not, but it was regular over a period of months that he gave to this important subject that God was calling him to. And since he had a job in the king's um, employment as a cupbearer, he had to do his praying around his job, just like you and I do. Sometimes we say, oh, but I work, I can't pray. Oh, I'm busy, but I can't pray. You know, I'm filled with all these things. Well, Nehemiah had that as well. But it was planned, it was persistent, and he gave regular time to it over a period of months, waiting for God to answer. Now, as he's thinking about moving from his country to Israel, because he was not living there at the time when God called, and the king notices, my cupbearer is pretty sad today. Why are you sad? And it says in um, chapter 2 that he prayed to the God of heaven and he answered the king. Do you get this? He shot up a quick prayer in an instant where he felt like, I really need God's help here. I need permission from the king to leave. Leave the job and go do this other job that God's calling me to do. So very quickly and in an instant, he offers up a silent prayer. There's planned prayer. There's persistent prayer, there's spontaneous prayer, and there's short prayer. And some people tell me, well, I just pray throughout the day. I have no set time of prayer. I just shoot up this and shoot up that. And they call it good. 
random thoughts, spontaneous, no real intention about taking a subject and saying, okay, God, what about my family? What about my son or daughter? What about my job? And sit and pray about that for a while. Now I just shoot up a prayer here. There, It's kind of random as it happens. It pops into your mind. There are areas that God wants us to deal with. And you know as you read the Bible, we all struggle with different things. Some people struggle with gossip or being irritable or impatience or lack of love for a per person, impure thoughts or wandering eyes. There's just a wide range of things that God's working on. He's constructing in you. And as we face our sins, we pray, God, enable me. I have to do something about this. You can't deal with those things with a random, shoot up a prayer here and there throughout the day. You will never get to the issue. Notice Romans 8.13. If you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you're going to live. Notice here again the dependence, the discipline. If you put to death, there's your effort, there's your discipline, your part. But it also says, if by the Spirit, God's part. Holiness requires our effort and his nourishment. And unless you plan to pray, you're never going to pray. You're never going to deal with some things, really deal with them, and get any good answers. Sometimes we need to sit down, write a list, and say, okay, God, I know I struggle with this. And at some point, you need to deal with me, and I need to deal with this. But write it down so you don't ignore it. We can also pray, God, keep me from temptation. It tells us that in Matthew 6. It also says, pray that God will work in us what's pleasing to him, not to me. He knows far better than we do what we need. We have planned, unplanned, short, spontaneous prayers, but we need it all to keep us connected, to keep us dependent on him. I believe that one of the chief characteristics of our sinful nature is an attitude that I'm going to be independent of God here or in this area or this day or this moment or whatever it is because that's just part of who we are. Be aware that though we agree with God intellectually or spiritually or theologically, we're dependent on him. My natural tendency is not to be. And I have to work at that. The evil I do not want to do, that's what I do. It's present. It keeps showing up. Sometimes we fail so that God can show us how dependent we really need to be on him. One of the best ways then that as we learn this dependence is I need to pray. And I need to work at that. And that's my part, my effort, my investment in this. But I continually ask God, help me as I do this effort. And all of us struggle with devotions and with praying and reading the Bible and different issues. God will help us. He'll enable us. We have to remember that in order to become holy, we become like Jesus. Because apart from me, you're not going to do anything. You know, when we pull back from God and we walk away from him for a while or we stop reading the Bible for a while, you're going to do anything of value? Are you really going to accomplish much in life? What he wants? No. Christ was completely dependent on his Father. And he admitted it. He wasn't reluctant. He wasn't hesitant. 
He wasn't apologetic. Oh, you know, I, I'm really dependent on my father. No, he was dependent on God, and he could admit that. Two wings to the airplane, discipline, dependence. We need to fly. And when we overcompensate or balance in one area, we can go down. Or when we lean too much the other way, we can go down. We're not going to fly. God calls us to holiness. What kind of balance do you have? Let's bow our heads. And again, I will give you time to think about some of these issues and talk to God about them. God, we're often quick to say we love you. And we want to love you, and we, we do in some ways. But we want to love you better, in more true ways, more pure ways. I ask that you would enable each of us as we walk with you, that you would just keep showing us how we need to balance this within our life. And I thank you that you are one that can be depended on all the time. That you are faithful and true. You never change. You're reliable and strong. You're powerful and patient. Bless us as we live this day and encourage our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. <clears throat> God is constructing your house. Allow him to build it and to watch over your life and your situations for his sake. Amen.